A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindu Newspaper Analysis brought to you by Shankar AAS Academy for the date 9th of February 2023. And displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. Today, we are going to start our discussion with this front page news article. It reports about the death toll caused due to the earthquakes which hit Turkey and Syria earlier this week. And according to the article, the death toll has now crossed 11,000 and it is nearing towards 12,000 mark. And this is the content of the news article given here. So in this context, let's learn about the science behind the earthquakes. See in yesterday's Hindu daily news analysis, we saw about the basics of the earthquakes and this is the continuation of that discussion okay so if you haven't watched that video go and watch it first because it contains basics of earthquakes and after watching that video only you will get a complete understanding of this video now coming to today's discussion as we saw already earthquakes causes two types of waves one is body wave and the other one is surface waves and further Body waves can be divided into two types. One is P wave and the other one is S wave. Okay. Now let's see about the P waves. See P wave is a type of longitudinal wave. And just like sound waves, it can also travel through all three mediums. That is, it can travel through solid, liquid and gas. Now take a look at this picture here. See this picture shows the shadow zone of P waves generated by an earthquake. See just now I said P waves travel through all three mediums right. But the velocity and the direction of the wave changes if there is a medium change in which the wave travels ok. From the picture here we can notice a shadow region that is a shadow zone and this shadow zone does not receive any P waves. Now what is the reason for that? Now observe carefully, the inner surface of the earth can be divided into two mediums. One is liquid medium and the other one is solid medium. When the P waves enter the liquid medium from the solid medium, it undergoes refraction. Again, when it comes out of the inner core, it further undergoes a second set of refraction. And this is the exact reason why there is a shadow zone of P waves. And just now we saw when there is a medium change, then the velocity and the direction of the wave also changes, right? And all these factors only leads to the creation of a shadow zone of P waves. Now let us say an earthquake is taking place near Chennai. The P waves generated by the earthquake would travel in all directions around the globe. But due to the refraction, there will be a shadow zone in some other part of the world where P waves from the Chennai earthquake would not be recorded in the seismographic which is kept there. And know that the shadow zone of P waves is 80 degrees. This means that 40 degree in one side and 40 degree in another side of the travel of the waves. Now let's move on to the S waves. See S waves they travel in transverse motion and know that they cannot travel in liquids. So, there will be a larger shadow zone for S waves when compared with the P waves. Now, let us take this image here. In this image, here only earthquake is happening. And because S waves cannot travel in the liquid medium, this entire region is S wave shadow zone. And this is all about the shadow zone of two types of body waves. Now, let us see about the surface waves. See, surface waves are caused due to interaction of body waves with the surface of the earth. And they develop in the immediate neighborhood of the epicenter and they affect only the surface of the earth which is closer to the epicenter. And know that there are two types of surface waves. One is called as love wave and the other one is called as Rayleigh waves. See, love waves are types of surface waves which move the ground side to side. And it is the fastest of the two types of surface waves. Now coming to the Rayleigh waves. See Rayleigh waves moves along the ground like how a wave rolls on a lake or a ocean. So its movement is both up and down and also side to side. So the Rayleigh waves causes the most shaking and the damage from the earthquake. 
and this is all about the two types of surface waves and with this we have also come to the end of this particular article discussion in this discussion we saw about body waves and surface waves in body waves we saw about the p waves shadow zone and the s waves shadow zone and after that we saw about surface waves in that we saw two types one is love waves and the other one is rayleigh waves now with this let us move on to the next article discussion now take a look at this snippet here it says that former us secretary of state hillary clinton visited the historic elora caves which is located in the state of maharashtra and this is what is given in this small article here in this context let's learn about ajanta and elora caves in prelims perspective firstly let us look at the location of both the caves see both the caves of ajanta and elora they are located in the aurangabad district of maharashtra even though both the caves are located in the same district the distance between one and the other is 100 kilometers so if a statement comes in the prelims saying that ajanta and elora are adjacent cave systems which are located under the same rock complex then that statement is wrong see these ajanta and elora caves both are separate caves with a 100 km gap between them here note that ajanta caves are located in the gorge of river vagora and this is about the location of ajanta and elora caves so where they are located they are located in the same district in the state of maharashtra and the district is aurangabad are they nearby each other no they are two separate cave systems with the 100 km gap between them now moving on to the formation of these caves know that ajanta and elora caves were formed due to volcanic eruptions when the indian plate started moving towards the eurasian plate which happened approximately 100 million years ago it passed over a hot spot region in the southwestern indian ocean and this mantle plume hot spot region is nothing but the present day reunion hot spot system and this led to the volcanic activity in the present day maharashtra region which resulted in the creation of deccan traps and some adjacent cave systems located around it and this is how the cave systems of ajanta and elora came into being so what caused the formation of these caves volcanic activity because of the movement of indian plate towards the eurasian plate and the mantle plume hotspot region it is located in the southwestern indian ocean now coming to the most important part see both the caves have huge cultural significance and this is because of the carving that was done on them and these carvings were done during the ancient period now first of all let us see about the ajanta caves see ajanta it is a series of rock cut structures with over 29 caves see out of these 29 caves 25 functioned as buddhist viharas and four functioned as buddhist chaityas see here viharas are the resting places of buddhist monks and chaityas refers to the prayer halls of the buddhists so from this we can see that rock cut caves of ajanta are exclusively buddhist and the time period of development of these rock cut structure in ajanta stretches ranges from 200 bc to 650 ad see the painting inside the caves were done using fresco painting technique fresco is a type of mural painting see mural paintings are nothing but any paintings done on the walls or the ceiling of a structure fresco paintings are done on coating made up of moist lime plaster and this allows the pigments to seep in and create a long lasting image on the rock surface and lime plaster is a traditional type of paste used to cover the surface of internal walls and ceilings before painting it's like making the surface smooth and even for the painting to be done on them okay so for this process they used lime plaster at that time now this is all about the ajanta caves now moving on to elora caves see unlike ajanta which was predominantly an exclusive buddhist cave elora caves houses the rock cut structures of all the three major religions of ancient india it houses 17 hindu structures 12 buddhist structures and five are dedicated to jain religion 
Here note that the rock cut structures inside the Ellora caves were considered to be built between 5th and 11th century AD. So Ellora cave structures are newer when compared to Ajanta caves. And these are the two major differences between Ajanta and Ellora cave systems. Okay. Now with this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion we saw about the location of Ajanta and Ellora caves and how they are formed. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the significance of Ajanta and Ellora caves and differences between them. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. For our next discussion, let us take this editorial article. This editorial is about the Indo-Nordic relation. Currently, Indo-Nordic relations are in news because the trade ministers of Norway and Finland are visiting India together on February 9 and 10th. See the editorial highlights various ongoing cooperation between India and the Nordic countries and it also highlights various areas with potential for growth in the future and this is about the editorial. So in our discussion today we will see the points mentioned in the editorial in detail and also we will discuss about the significance of Nordic countries for India. But before getting into the discussion go through the syllabus that I have highlighted here for your reference. Now let us start our discussion. First of all, let us understand about the Nordic region and the countries in the Nordic region. Now look at this map here. See this map highlights the Nordic countries. The Nordic countries include the sovereign states of Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway and Sweden. It also includes two autonomous territories of Faroe Islands and Greenland one autonomous region of Aland Islands and two unincorporated regions of Jan Mayen and Svalbard. Here Greenland and Faroe Islands belong to Denmark and Aland Islands belong to Finland and Svalbard and Jan Mayen belong to Norway. See these Nordic countries are geographically and culturally little identical. They share a common way of life, common history, religion and social structure and this is the reason these countries are clubbed together via the term Nordic. See to ensure cooperation between the region the countries have established the Nordic Council and the Nordic Council was established in 1952 and it is a formal interparliamentary Nordic cooperation body. See the Nordic Council has representatives from all the Nordic countries. Apart from this know that the countries in the Nordic region have established stable, secure and welfare based societies. The Nordic countries are at the forefront of developing new green technologies like hydrogen energy, offshore wind farms, battery storage and carbon capture. And it is due to this reason India is trying to engage with the Nordic countries. On one hand India is aiming to become the next superpower which can learn from the Nordic economic model and develop a welfare based socially sustainable society. And on the other hand, India plans to become a carbon neutral society by 2070 and to achieve this India can get green technology solutions from Nordic countries. So these are the two main reasons why India is trying to engage with the Nordic countries. One is to develop a welfare based socially sustainable society and the other one is to learn green technology solutions from Nordic countries. So to systematically engage with the Nordic countries the Indo-Nordic summit was established. See the first India Nordic summit was held in Sweden in the year 2018 and the summit created a ground for exchange of ideas between India and the Nordic region. See, the Nordic region shared their expertise in the culture of innovation, clean technology, maritime solutions, life sciences and agriculture. India on its side shared its expertise on creating a strong skill pool and digital solutions. And after that, the second Indo-Nordic summit was held in Copenhagen, Denmark in May 2022. And in the second Indo-Nordic summit, various common interests between the countries were discussed. Firstly, the second summit, which happened in the year 2022, gave an opportunity for the participating countries to review the progress of 
India Nordic relations since first India Nordic summit so it was like a review of the relationship of india and the nordic countries since the first summit secondly as the summit was held in the post pandemic phase discussions were held between the countries regarding the economic recovery in the post pandemic era so secondly they talked about the economic recovery thirdly the discussions between the countries focused on cooperation in the maritime sector see the nordic countries have expertise in sustainable ocean management and india with its long coastline has to adopt this sustainable ocean management for both stable economic growth and the environmental sustainability so as a part of this discussion our prime minister also invited the nordic companies to invest in blue economy in india mainly as a part of india's sagar mala project So the third discussion factor is the maritime sector and the sustainable ocean management. And fourthly, there was this discussion regarding cooperation between the countries in the Arctic region. See, India's Ministry of Earth Sciences last year unveiled India's Arctic policy, and the main aim of India's Arctic policy is to make India's presence felt in the resource-rich and rapidly transforming Arctic region. and as a part of this policy india aims to counter the climate change in the arctic region so in the second indo nordic summit our prime minister mentioned that india's arctic policy provides a good framework for expansion of india nordic cooperation in the arctic region now fifthly our prime minister also invited the sovereign wealth funds of nordic countries to invest in india now here what is a sovereign wealth fund See, sovereign wealth fund is the surplus money that a country accumulates over time. Basically, sovereign wealth fund is the money owned by a nation which is invested in various financial resources. Know that the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund has 1.15 trillion dollars. So, our prime minister invited the sovereign wealth fund to invest in India because. as we all know india has a huge potential for growth but the problem here is that there is a lack of sufficient availability of capital so if the sovereign wealth fund is invested in india indian companies will get the much needed capital investment and using this capital they can grow very fastly on the other hand the sovereign wealth fund can also make huge profits due to india's growth potential so it's like a win win situation right indian companies will get the much needed capital investment and the nordic countries they will get the huge profits from india's potential growth i'll tell you an interesting fact here the norwegian sovereign wealth fund has already invested over 17.6 billion dollars and it is one of the largest single foreign investors in india and finally the most important agenda of the summit which is the exchange of ideas here the focus areas are combating climate change sustainable development innovation digitalization and green and clean growth see the nordic countries have expertise in these fields and india can learn from the nordic countries experience in these areas and india can accelerate its growth many fold by implementing these ideas so by doing this India can ensure that the economic growth is sustainable and green and this is about the second nordic summit now let us quickly recap what all we saw just now see firstly they reviewed the relationship since the first summit secondly they discussed about the economic recovery thirdly they discussed about cooperation in maritime sector especially sustainable ocean management fourthly they discussed about cooperation in arctic region and fifthly our prime minister invited to invest the foreign wealth funds of nordic countries in india and finally the agenda of the summit is the exchange of ideas and this is about the second indo nordic summit now finally let us conclude our discussion by seeing the significance of nordic cooperation and benefit that india can derive from this cooperation See we have covered some of the significances of Indo Nordic cooperation while covering the outcome of the second summit itself that is points like Nordic countries role in aiding India's green growth 
cooperation in combating climate change aiding the green transition in india lessons in sustainable and stable economic growth lessons in establishing a welfare state lessons in establishing a successful sovereign wealth fund ocean management and cooperation in the arctic region now in addition to this the nordic countries are supporting india's bid for the unsc so the cooperation with these countries will ensure their continued support for india's bid for the permanent membership in the unsc so while concluding this editorial the author suggests some steps to further the cooperation with these countries here the author suggests the establishment of a free trade agreement see finalizing the free trade and investments agreement which is fair equitable and balanced between the nordic countries and india will ensure continued cooperation between the india and the nordic countries and this is what is the suggestion given by the author in this editorial now that is all for this discussion in this discussion we saw about the nordic region and the nordic countries and we saw about the relationship between india and the nordic countries we saw first indo nordic summit 2018 and we saw the second indo nordic summit 2022 we saw some of the outcomes of it and finally we ended our discussion by seeing some of the significance of nordic countries for india and the suggestion given by the author to further this cooperation now with these points let us move on to the next article discussion now take a look at this news article it reports about a new study conducted by newcastle university this report is the first global assessment of areas and people who are at greatest risk of glacial lake outburst floods see as per the report nearly 3 million people in india are at risk due to glacial flooding and this is the essence of the article given here in this context let's learn about glacial flooding See the term glacial flooding refers to the flooding caused due to sudden melting of glaciers. Here glaciers are nothing but massive bodies of slowly moving ice. They are made up of fallen snow which gets compressed into ice over many centuries. So the flooding is due to sudden melting of glaciers and glaciers are massive bodies of moving ice and this ice is formed by compression of snow particles now coming to the reasons for glacial flooding see the primary reason for glacial flooding is the phenomenon of global warming as global warming is increasing day by day there is an increase in the temperature of the atmosphere and due to increase in temperature of the atmosphere glaciers in most part of the world are melting at a high rate and it is due to this melting huge human population who are near the glacial lakes are at high risk of facing a flood here the term glacial lake refers to the lake which primarily gets its water from melting glaciers see when the threshold of the lake gets filled then there will be flooding right which means overflowing of water from the lakes and this resultant flood is only called as glacial lake outburst flood so it is self explanatory right from the name itself we can easily understand that it is the flood which is caused by the outburst of glacial lakes see the study estimates 15 million people to be at risk from flooding caused by glacial lakes and out of this 15 million nearly 3 million people are from india itself here note that people living in the countries of india pakistan peru china account for over half of those at risk of facing glacial floods and according to the report in asia alone nearly 1 million people live within just 10 km of a glacial lake and this is the most vulnerable population which needs to be closely looked at and the report suggests that policy measures need to be brought to safeguard this vulnerable population and this is all about this glacial flooding and glacial lake outburst floods and the study conducted by the new kazal university now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now for our next discussion let us take this text in context article it is about the disinvestment by government 
As we all know, the government has set a disinvestment target of 51,000 crore in the union budget of 2023 to 24, and this value is nearly 21 percentage lower than the budget estimate for the current year, and only 1,000 crores higher than the revised estimate. See, it is also the lowest target in the seven years. Here, budget estimates represent the idea of upcoming government projects and their progression. See the revised estimates explain the expenses that are going to happen. Moreover, the surprising fact here is that the center has not yet achieved the disinvestment target for 2022-23 so far. So in this background, let us quickly go through what is disinvestment and the advantages and disadvantages of it. But before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. Now what is disinvestment see the shares of various government companies that are held by the government acts as the earning assets at the disposal of the government what does this mean these assets or shares they can be sold at any time to generate capital so when these shares are sold to earn capital this process is only called as disinvestment which means government is selling its shares of various government companies disinvestment typically includes the sale or liquidation of assets of an organization or government but know that in all cases the government share should never go below 51 percentage know that there are three main approaches to disinvestment they include minority disinvestment majority disinvestment and complete privatization In minority disinvestment the government tries to preserve the majority stake in the company which is around 51 percentage so the government share will never go below 51 percentage in case of minority disinvestment so by doing this the government has the control of the management now when it comes to majority disinvestment the government gives up the majority stake in the government held company which means the government's share will be less than 51 percentage so when the government retains a minority stake in the company after the disinvestment it is known as majority disinvestment so majority shares are disinvested now the third approach is complete privatization see it is a type of majority disinvestment in which the company's entire ownership is transferred to a buyer as a result 100 percentage control of the company is passed down to the buyer and these are the types of disinvestment see i have given here the means of disinvestment you can pause the video and go through it okay now coming to the major question who will carry out this disinvestment process see the union finance ministry has a separate department for undertaking disinvestment related procedures and this department is called as Department of Investment and Public Asset Management Now we saw about disinvestment how it is done different approaches and the ways in which disinvestment is done by the government Now you should know why government does disinvestment See the main reason is to reduce the fiscal burden of the government and it is also done to bridge the revenue shortfall for that particular year Secondly The government uses the disinvestment proceeds to finance the fiscal deficit. The government also uses the disinvestment proceeds to invest in the economy or social sector programs or to retire the government debt. Other than this, disinvestment encourages private ownership of assets and trading in the open market. So what does this mean? If the disinvestment is successful, then the government do not have to fund the loss making companies additionally disinvestment indirectly increases the investment scenario in the economy to stimulate spending just now we saw that with the disinvestment proceeds government will invest in the economy or the social sector programs right this will stimulate the spending so this is one another reason and finally disinvestment might be used for funding various large scale infrastructure development projects and know that there are some indirect advantages to the disinvestment process they include maintaining and promoting competition in the market building competence 
strengthening R&D, depoliticizing essential services, rationalizing and retraining the workforce. And these are all the reasons why disinvestment is done. See, everything has its own advantages and disadvantages, right? So, if disinvestment has advantages, then it also means it has disadvantages also. Now, let's see them one by one. Firstly, the selling of profit-making PSUs result in the loss of regular income to the government. This is the major disadvantage. See, the government may think that it is a loss-making PSU, but what if it is just because of the economic cycle? And what if after some time it will be a profit-making one? Then it is a loss to the government, right? So, this is the first disadvantage. Secondly, complete privatization may result in Changing from public monopoly to private monopoly. See, if private monopolies and all came into existence, then it would turn into exploitation only. They will exploit their position to increase the cost of various services and they will earn higher profits. This is the second disadvantage. Thirdly, private sector governed by profit motive has a tendency to use the capital intensive techniques to further the production. See, it is obvious, right? In an economy, if a company want to make profit, it has to increase its production. To increase the production, what will the company do? They will buy machineries, heavy equipments to increase the production. And as a result of this, the unemployment problem in India will be affected very much. So, privatization may lead to loss of jobs of many workers because their place will be replaced by heavy machineries. Now, these are all the major three disadvantages of disinvestment. Now, with this, we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about what is disinvestment. We saw different types of it. We saw different ways in which government disinvest a government-owned company. And after that, we saw the advantages of disinvestment and the disadvantages of disinvestment. Now, with these points, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this article here. This news article says that RBI has decided to provide UPI access to non-resident Indians who have international mobile numbers linked to their NRE or NRO accounts. See, there is also a proposal to permit all inbound travelers to India to access the UPI for their merchant payments while they are in the country. And this facility will be first provided to travellers from the G20 countries arriving at select international airports. See, this is done to expand the scope of the unified payments interface. And this is about the news article given here. In this context, in our discussion, we'll see about the NRE and NRO account. First of all, let us take the NRE account. Here, NRE means non-resident external. So, NRE account means non-resident external account. See, it is an account of an NRI to transfer his or her foreign earnings to India. Now, let us understand this with an example. See, person A is a non-resident Indian living in USA and he is working in a software firm and making a good amount of money. And person A has a brother B in India who is preparing for UPSC. And to support his brother B, person A is establishing a NRE account in India and transfer his dollar earnings to India. So, from the NRE account, now the person B who is preparing for UPSC can withdraw cash denominated in rupee. Here, if you notice, person A is depositing the money, that is the US dollar, in the NRE account. So, what does this mean? This means that if more people create NRE accounts, India's forex reserve will increase. So, to aid this, the principal and the interest from the NRE account is not taxed. And also, if you notice carefully, the NRE account is prone to the exchange rate risk. But how? Let me explain. As we already saw, person A is depositing dollars in NRE account. He is depositing his dollars to help his brother who is preparing for UPSC. Now, let us say he deposits $1,000. At the current exchange rate, the NRE account will have around 80 to 1,000 rupees in it. But in a few months, if rupee depreciates further 
and the exchange rate becomes 100 rupees per dollar now what will happen this will be reflected in the nre account let us say that person a who has deposited the money is having some money problems and he is trying to withdraw money from the nre account now what is the current exchange rate it is 100 rupees per dollar so initially when he deposited 1000 dollars it amounted to 82000 rupees now he is having 82000 rupees in his account now due to the depreciation of rupee he will get only 820 dollars the exchange rate is 100 rupee per dollar so 82000 divided by 100 is equal to 820 dollars so even though person a has deposited 1000 dollars due to rupee depreciation he has lost 180 dollars so this is what i meant when i said nre account is prone to exchange rate risk so this is all you have to know about the nre account which is non residential external account now there is this another account called as nro account here nro means non resident ordinary account see here nro account is an account of an nri to manage his or her income that is earned in india see what we saw in the nre account it was to deposit earnings from the foreign country but nro account it is to manage the income that is earned in india for example person a who is working in the usa has some ancestral property in india and through that property he is earning some income in india and this is the income of person a that is earned in india and this amount can be deposited in the nro account so unlike the nre account where the deposit is made in dollars the deposit in the nro account is made in rupees and that is exactly why both the principal and the interest earned from the nro accounts are taxed but what we saw in the nre account the principal and the interest earned will not be taxed but here both will be taxed and also since the deposit is made in rupees the deposit made in the nro account is not vulnerable to exchange rate risks and these are some of the differences between nre and nro account now with this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion in this discussion we saw about nre account and nro account nre account is for transfer of money that is earned in foreign to india nro account is to manage the earnings that is earned in india by an nri so this is the key difference of nre and nro accounts now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion oh yes how can we miss this article here see viewers this article was on the front page of today's newspaper now according to this article animal welfare board of india wants to name february 14 as cow hug day see we all know february 14 for some other reason right i don't have to tell you what day it is so on that day animal welfare board of india wants to encourage people to hug cows and the board said that this action would bring emotional richness and increase the individual as well as collective happiness and i couldn't miss this article so this is the crux of the news article given here see we are not going to discuss whether february 14 should be named as cow hug day or not we are going to use this opportunity to see about the animal welfare board of india okay first of all the animal welfare board of india is a statutory advisory body on animal welfare laws see this board it promotes animal welfare in the country as we already saw it is a statutory body so it was established in 1962 under section 4 of the prevention of cruelty to animals act 1960 and know that Shrimati Rukmani Devi Arundel pioneered the setting up of the board with its headquarters at Chennai. She even guided the activities of the board for nearly 20 years till her death in 1986. And this is about the board. Now coming to its composition, see the board consists of 28 members. It includes 6 members from the parliament, 2 members from Rajya Sabha and 4 members from Lok Sabha. and the term of office of these members that is these 28 members 
is for a period of three years. So this is about the composition and term of office of members of the Animal Welfare Board of India. Now with this information, let us move on to see the important functions and roles of the board. Firstly, the board ensures that the animal welfare laws in the country are diligently followed. Secondly, the board provides grants to the animal welfare organizations. Here grants means financial assistance, okay? Thirdly, it advises the government of India on animal welfare issues. Fourthly, it encourages or provides for the construction of sheds, water troughs and these only aid in providing veterinary assistance to the animals, okay? And fifthly, the board aids in imparting education in relation to human treatment of animals. And not just this, the board also encourages the formation of public opinion against the infliction of unnecessary pain or suffering to animals. And finally, it also aids in promoting the animal welfare by means of lectures, books, postures, cinematographic exhibitions, etc. See here I have listed only some of the important functions, okay? Now go and read about the other functions if you want in the website of Animal Welfare Board of India, okay? But you have to have a broader picture of what the board does. And that is all is enough, okay? Now with this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion we saw about Animal Welfare Board of India, its establishment, its composition, term of office, and finally, we ended our discussion by seeing some of the important functions and roles of Animal Welfare Board of India. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion. See, so today we have five questions. I'll solve four of them and one of them is a quiz question for you. Now, let us take this first question. With respect to earthquakes, consider the following statements. Statement 1. Earthquakes occurring along the convergent plate margins are stronger than those which are occurring in the divergent margin. See, this statement is correct. Convergent margins, earthquakes are the strongest because it only creates lot of friction. Statement 2. Deep focus earthquakes generally cause huge damage when compared with shallow focus earthquakes. See, shallow focus earthquakes are the ones which cause huge damage when compared to deep focus earthquakes. See, I have displayed here the range of shallow, intermediate and deep focus earthquakes. Just go through it. And know that the earthquake which hit Turkey on early hours of Monday had its focus at the depth of 18 km from the surface of the earth. So, we found out that statement 1 is correct and statement 2 is incorrect. So, the correct answer here is option A, 1 only. Now, moving on to the second question. See, it is a previous year question which was asked in the year prelims 2021. Which of the following statement is correct? Ajanta Caves lie in the gorge of Vakora River. Sanchi Stupa lies in the gorge of Chambal River. Pandulena Cave Shrines lie in the gorge of Narmada River. Amravati Stupa lies in the gorge of Godavari River. See, the correct answer here is option A. From our discussion, you know this answer. Now, let us look at the locations of all the other three structures also. See, Sanchi Stupa lies in an upland plateau region just west of Betwa River in the state of Madhya Pradesh. And Pandulena Caves, it is an ancient rock cut sculpture located near Gomai River. You note that this cave structure is also known as Nashik Caves and it is located in Maharashtra. Now, Amaravati Stupa, it is located in the gorge of Krishna River. So, it is not Godavari River, Krishna River. So, the correct answer here is option A, Ajanta Caves lie in the gorge of Vagora River. Now, moving on to the third question, with reference to National Disaster Management Authority, consider the following statements. Statement 1, President is the ex-officio chairperson of National Disaster Management Authority. The statement is incorrect because we all know that Prime Minister is the ex-officio chairperson. Statement 2. Headquarters of National Disaster Management Authority is located in Kolkata. The statement is also incorrect. Headquarters is located in Delhi. So, the correct answer to this question is option D. Neither one nor two. Now, moving on to the fourth question. Consider the following statements regarding 
Foreign Currency Non-Resident Accounts Statement 1. FCNR is an account that allows you to save money earned overseas in a foreign currency in a term deposit. Statement 2. The account holder can maintain deposits in foreign currency. Statement 3. FCNR deposits are taxable in India. See here statement 1 and 2 are correct. FCNR account is a term or fixed deposit account which is held by NRI in India in foreign currency. Since FCNR account is maintained in foreign currency, it is not prone to exchange rate risk. So from this we know that statement 1 and 2 are correct. Now coming to statement 3, see FCNR deposits they are not taxable in India. So statement 3 is incorrect. So the correct answer to this question is option A 1 and 2 only. Now moving on to the next question. See viewers this is only the quiz question for you. Read the question and post your answer in the comment section. See aspirants I have given here the mains practice questions. So if you are interested write it and post your answer in the comment section. If you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. And with this, we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankaraya's Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.